A new House Judiciary Committee investigation is looking into the details of the Internal Revenue Service's visit to the home of Twitter Files journalist Matt Taibbi. In a letter to Internal Revenue Commissioner Daniel Werfel from yesterday, Representative Jim Jordan writes, the IRS's production shows that the IRS opened its examination of Mr. Taibbi's 2018 tax return on December 24th, 2022. The same day, Taibbi posted a Twitter files report. Joining us to tell us about his IRS investigation is Matt Taibbi himself. Welcome back to Rising. Thanks for having me, Brianna. So, Taibbi, the obvious implication here is that there was some retaliatory move by the IRS to investigate you because of their dissatisfaction with your choice to report on the Twitter files. Walk us through what happened. Well, so this originally came up the day um, I testified before the House Weaponization of Government Committee. Um, after I testified, you might remember that was kind of a circus. Uh, mm -hmm. I took the train home from Washington, and when I got to my house in New Jersey, I found that a note had been left in my door. My wife told me that an IRS agent had been to our home. Um, I sat on that information for a few days, not knowing what to do about it, and finally was sort of advised to tell the committee about it uh, because it would have, I would have been remiss in not informing, uh, informing them of a possible effort to intimidate a witness. But I didn't think uh, really that it, um, it, it, was, it was that. I, I thought it, was a, it had to be some kind of coincidence. It was too silly to imagine that the, they would be trying to get in my head over you know, this story. But um, so I didn't comment then, and I said I was going I wanted to wait for answers from the Treasury Department. Uh, but the stuff that came back from the letter from Jim Jordan, when they told me the date that they opened the case and what the case was about, uh, this was the date was t December twenty fourth. That's Christmas Eve, a Saturday. That was a very big day in my life. That was um, a moment when I put out a a story. I was actually a little bit afraid to publish about ties between Twitter and intelligence agencies. Mm. And it was, this, again, it was a Saturday. It was, it was Christmas Eve. And the, the issue was a three-year-old, uh, to me, I think fictional issue um, that they had never talked to me about before. So that was very concerning. And there's some other concerning stuff in the, in the report, but that, that was a big you know, uh, alarm bell for me. Yeah, I remember when that Twitter files report came out because I was thinking like, oh my God, these major scoops on, on holidays. Why do you keep <laughs> doing this to me, Matt Taibbi? So I, for, for, you know, for government, regardless of what you think of government bureaucracies, the idea that, you know, they're working overtime on the weekend on Christmas Eve, just doing kind of the, you know, the day-to-day -day basic maintenance on an old IRS case, is beyond any possible reasonable belief, right? There's, there's, it, it, you're not, it's not conspiratorial at all to think it's related to the work you were doing when there's, it, it just seems so overwhelmingly unlikely that like in the normal co course of IRS work, that would be the time for an investigation to launch. Yeah, I really, I can't think of an innocent explanation for it, especially when you couple it with what the issue is. And one of the reasons that I um, told the committee uh, they originally, when they left the note on my door, told me not to call for four days. Apparently, that's a tactic. They like to let you stew over the weekend and wonder <laughs> what, what the problem is. Mm. When I finally called them, uh, they told me that the issue, part of, one of two issues, was that my 2018 electronic tax return had been rejected due to identity theft concerns. Now, that made me nervous because I had never heard that before, and it seems like that would have come up. Uh, over the course of four years or whatever it was, uh, and when we got the you know the the information yesterday or the or, you know the other day, um, what they said basically was that they were opening a brand new uh, they were like assigning a new date for an investigation over that issue, which they had not by even their own admission. Uh, taken up for three years, over three years, which is beyond the statutory exemption, and was a fictional issue anyway. Um, so th th that kind of, for me, leaves no doubt. Yeah, so when you reached out and asked, uh, you told the committee about this and asked for some explanation about the timing, what was going on here, raising concerns about retaliation, you were told, am I correct, that the, the gap in time was because during the pandemic, uh, folks weren't making, uh, IRS agents weren't making field visits. Does that rationale hold up in your thinking? 
Well, it seems a little silly. Like, the, the, I don't think the pandemic would have prevented them from sending a letter. Mm. Um, and by their own admission, they didn't do that over this issue. Uh, they claim to have sent me two letters about this, one in October of 2019 and one, uh, I guess, in January of 2020, um, or at least two communications. Uh, one of them was a letter. Uh, but they didn't produce either of those. And in the interim period, I didn't hear anything from them, even by their own admission. So uh, there's that. Then there's the fact that it's not, even by anyone's standards, it's not a serious enough matter to warrant a home visit. Um, so all of that stuff, you know, you combine it. You know, I don't let, it does, it, I don't let the sound conspiratorial, but it, it's hard to draw any other conclusion. Yeah, and given the fact that you got that kind of warning letter from Stacey Plaskett mm -hmm. about how lying on under oath was a, a, a you know a criminal offense, you know not that you did of course uh, lie in any any kind of purposeful way while you were testifying, but many people looked at that letter as kind of openly in in a form of intimidation. So this doesn't seem so far out of line with the kind of thing that Congress members have shown themselves as willing to do. Right. I mean, the the step that the you know, that Representative Plaska took and, you know, according to Lee Fong's reporting, um, didn't just involve her. There were other members of the of the, um, you know, the the leadership that were involved in composing that letter to me, which accused me, you know, threatened me with a five year prison sentence mm -hmm. over, you know, really a typo. As essentially, I mean, it was a mistake for sure. But, um, you know, that that was sort of overtly threatening. Um, this is a little more concerning to me, though, though, because it suggests that somebody in another agency got on the phone and called the IRS because mm -hmm. none of the re the reports that I that I did, I mean, they can touch on agencies like the CIA, the FBI, the DI DHS, the ODNI, um, but they weren't about the IRS. So uh, it's hard to imagine what the sequence of events could have been here. Yeah, and, and that is what, you know, your reporting, which we've talked about a lot, a lot on this show, has has shown is this level of interaction between various government agencies and then other forces, social media platforms, uh, the media itself, in a way that, it, you know, concerns a lot of us from a free speech standpoint, from a civil liberty standpoint. And you and Michael Schellenberger and others have been bringing this to the public's attention, including talking to Congress about this. It's so interesting, and I think very disturbing and sad, that it's taken on um, such a partisan kind of lens. I mean, the only people, frankly, interested in this are, I mean, a lot of independent leftists like my esteemed co-host here, but from a party standpoint, it's, it's Republicans, when the underlying concern shouldn't really be partisan because a lot of these agencies uh, you know, these are agencies that were operating under Republican administrations that were that were, you know, in, involve people who are not, you know, properly part of the Democratic or Republican consensus. You would think there, there could be, you know, Democrats could object to what they're seeing without, you know, impugning or throwing the Democratic Party under the bus or something like that. But what has emerged when, you know, when you're testifying, I mean, Stacey Plaskett's just, you know, one voice among many from the Democratic side that seems so you know, not only like disagreeing with you slightly on how the framing is, but wholly rejecting that there's something inappropriate here. In fact, they're suggesting the inappropriate behavior is is not, you know, suppressing more speech or or, or, or fighting misinformation harder or something like that. Or it's mine, you know. Right. I mean, I think <laughs> right. Um, yeah. No, I mean, I think that's one of the ironic things about uh, even that particular report, uh, which was uh, it was called Twitter and other government agencies. Uh, we had gotten a stack of um, reports that had been passed through the Foreign Influence Task Force to Twitter. Uh, in some cases, we knew which uh, agency they came from. In some cases, they didn't, but uh, we didn't. But the one of the things that was interesting was that it wasn't all about the right. There was a lot of stuff in there about, for instance, uh, pro Maduro supporters in you know in Venezuela. There was stuff about the Yellow Vest movement uh, in in Europe. Um, there was there were some leftist groups in Africa uh, that were on some of those lists, um, and we we talked about that some, you know, in in the reports. Uh, but yes, I, I didn't really see it as a partisan issue. I thought it was scary on several levels. First of all, 
why are so many tech companies in regular communication with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and the FBI's Foreign Influence Task Force? And then there was the sort of anti-competitive behavior aspect of it, which I thought was really striking, this, this idea that all of these companies were getting together and having kind of private codicils on speech and you know that what was going to be presented to the public that shouldn't have been a, a partisan issue either i thought that was disturbing but no i mean that that was part, that was one of the things that was frustrating about this now you've written so compellingly over the course of your career about corporate corruption um the the kinds of ways that money and politics undermines our democracy and given the fact that we just had this unprecedented uh, presidential loss last uh, launch last night on Twitter, and you are perhaps the most famous of the Twitter files uh, journalist. I wonder what you make of the whole setup, the technical issues that ended up happening, um, the kind of optics of a presidential candidate allying himself so closely with um, not just Elon Musk, who obviously is one of the richest man, men in the world, but David Sachs, another congressman, kind of called in and said, hey, uh, Elon, I love you. I, I bought a Tesla. The optics of that kind of very close personal relationship of politicians and people of wealth and power, uh, what, did, what did you make of the whole thing last night? I don't see that as terribly different from what goes on on uh, you know NBC, CNN, or even Fox for that matter. Uh, it's it's a new, they're attempting to create I think a third or a new pole of of media or a new pole of of politics. But of course, you know it 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 has a look to it that um, you know I think is off putting. Uh, the one of the criticisms of that event was that it was pitched, uh, it was going to be this open dialogue, there was going to be all this back and forth, but really it was just kind of a lot of craven bootlicking of the, the two people involved. Um, and so there wasn't a whole lot of sort of vibrant media exchange that went on there. However, I kind of, I disagree with the, the, the criticisms that I saw online a lot of, which were, oh, you know, how, how can you, uh, you know, criticize old Twitter for suppressing the Hunter Biden story and then turn around and do this? I, I don't think that's an apples to apples comparison. Um, but, you know, the, they, they would justify this on the grounds that they're at least open about it. Um, I don't know about that. I, you know, I, I think I'm more and more coming to the conclu conclusion that if any of these platforms have owners, there are always going to be problems. You, you know, you have uh, testified before Congress that I think the invitation of Republicans, uh, you know, there's this, you know, wep House weaponization of the federal government committee. Um, so much information has come to light. And what I'm wondering is, do you, you know, what is the realistic likelihood of, of action? Because Republicans will do this thing where they care a lot about privacy and civil liberties and free speech when they think when, for instance, you know, FISA courts are going after Trump and Trump people, but then everybody, Republicans and Democrats, like with, you know, Thomas Massey dissenting or something, votes to reauthorize Patriot Act stuff over and over again. Is there, and maybe the answer is no, and that's just depressing, but is there any evidence that it's sinking in on, uh, on, on either political side that it's, it's not just about them out to get you or your people, but like how, letting the government have these tools is just dangerous regardless of who's in charge and who it's affecting, and there needs to be legislation to stop that? That's a great question. I mean, I, I think we've all been through the, the process of being fooled um, sometimes on the other side of the aisle where we get excited because we think that there's actually going to be movement on some really important issue. That, I, that happened to me multiple times after the financial crisis where I thought, you know, there's a small group of, of politicians on the, the blue side who are really upset about, for instance, too big to fail issues and the bailouts. And there was a, a, a moment there where it looked like the whole party was going to get religion about doing things like breaking up the banks, um, you know, or prosecuting, uh, you know, white collar uh, crimes. And it just never happens. As you say, there's always this kind of, you know, one vote away moment where it just doesn't happen. I, so I'm, I'm cautious about that. I, you know, I went through now with Russiagate, I remember talking to a number of Republican members at the beginning of that whole scandal who seemed, I thought, genuinely to be getting religion about FISA. I think some of them were, were actually really shocked um, by what they found out. 
But you never know how real that is and how they'll vote when the time comes and whether this is just opportunism. You have to hope it isn't, but uh, you know, there's, there's nothing else you can do. Yeah. Last question for me, Matt. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about the announcement of the new Twitter CEO, Linda Yaccarina, who comes over from NBC Universal. Some people who are very much fans of Elon Musk were frustrated by what felt like a more establishment choice. Others say, say this is a, an expected and reasonable choice for someone whose primary concern is building up advertising revenue again. Did you have any thoughts? Well, I don't really know what was going on there, but I, I do know that Twitter was having a tremendously difficult time with advertiser boycotts. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, and that was massively uh, impacting the company's ability to project out into the future that they would ever be profitable again, or that they would ever be in the black. And, you know, from the outside, it's, it certainly looks like a decision to bring in somebody who's going to smooth the transition to rolling back some of those boycotts. But what does that mean? I don't know. I mean, it's not from my point of view, the, it's interesting that, you know, the Twitter file stories kind of ended right around the time um, that a lot of these changes started happening. But mm. um, but it's hard to say, I, mm. you know, I know there were a lot of people who, who were very, very disappointed by uh, her appointment and, you know, the optics of it from if if you're a Spe free speech champion or you're worried about the quote unquote censorship industrial complex, it doesn't look great, mm. for sure. Mm. Matt, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me on.